Before, uh, I'd like to ask the, the first question, I guess, and that is the, the Pasionetti Index. Is that, is the assumption that um, we've set the inflation target too high and therefore bond interests are, are, are very high and they, uh, the bond interest goes up and, and uh, therefore there's a, there's a loss in, uh, in labor in terms of uh, its, uh, its increase relative to the um, average productivity. Uh, the question I have for you is that part of, of uh, managed capitalism that uh, Robert Kuttner is talking about, should there not be a policy, uh, a macro policy, uh, that links um, uh, labor product or shares labor productivity uh, with with the labor. There's this uh, a share of of the capitalists um, that, that that split profits between or to maintain uh, uh, wage increases that are comparable to increased labor productivity. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. Thank you, uh, uh, Peter. I. Uh, by the way, uh, in that statement, if anybody is interested, you could email me. I'd be happy to send you that original declaration that we signed. Okay? But what we said there, we requested, because we thought that was the least we could do, which is to get a dual mandate, which included full employment as an official target. Now, the question is, what do we mean by full employment? And that's a big issue that I'm not going to get into right now. But we also raised other concerns in terms of goals, and one of them was the need to have a, a distributionally, more equitable distribution of income. Okay? We said that that should also be a goal of a central bank. It is a public institution, and it should have that as one of its mandates. Then the question is, again, how are we going to look at this? Well, we, as I showed you earlier with wages and productivity, that is to say when real wages are growing you know, more or less, you know, in proportion here, concomitantly with the productivity growth, with average labor productivity growth, the share of labor will remain constant. Or indeed, in any one group here, any kind of, you know, sector, if their real wages are growing, you know, with productivity, that means they're able to maintain their share of the pie. Now, it doesn't mean that we want to necessarily just keep it that way. Maybe you should get even more. I don't, I'm just saying this is an issue that we could get into. But at least to justify it, okay? Because the way it is now is that real wages are going to decline all the time if it's stuck in the box of the inflation targeting. That's the reality. If they t and the only reason, by the way, why it flattened out at the end is because they're not doing inflation targeting anymore. I have this graph. I'm like, I'll let it go. But it shows that. Now, what about this Pazinetti thing? It's the same idea. If real interest rates, we looked at long-term interest rates, we use this sort of criteria that rentiers are people, it's like the old Keynes idea of rentiers, which is that there are individuals who are just, you know, collecting from their whatever ownership of, you know, those financial assets. And what we find, of course, is that there was a mountain increase, in other words, the relationship between real interest rates, again, interest rates adjusted for the inflation rate and productivity growth, all of a sudden shot through the ceiling, okay? Starting in the late 70s and during the 80s and 90s. And then they started to come down subsequently. But during that whole era, what you see is that, it's like that 1% group, so to speak, or something akin to that, that was being favored by their ownership of capital. Not even profit in the sense of business here, because business is actually, I didn't show that one, but pro, uh, the rate of profit has been relatively constant now. We could get into all that okay. side here. So uh, two quick comment questions on these superb papers. Let me start with John. And uh, I first published John 39 years ago uh, in a cover story that he wrote for the magazine I was then, then editing on Social Security, which reads as if it could have been written yesterday. And uh, it's just a thrill to note that John has not skipped a beat. So bravo for that presentation. Question, if you relate your first slide to the later slides, the thing that jumps out at me is that the top 1%, the top 1 tenth, the top 100% 
is making off with all of the economy's gains of the past 40 years. And if we don't do something about pre-distribution, the pre-tax and transfer distribution of income, it seems to me that we can't rely on um, taxes and transfers, however they are financed, to do anything serious about inequality. You are just making it easier for the bottom 90 percent to sort of compete with each other over a diminished share of the yeah. pie. Um, and so, to use the technical term here, the need is to throttle the ruling class in order that they not make off with all of society's income. Um, I just wanted to add that to the mix because uh, the, other, the other observation is that, yes, the United States has a moderately more progressive tax system, but the pre-tax and transfer distribution in the U.S. is so terrific that it doesn't make a damn bit of difference. Um, for Mario, question, comment, um, I think the timing and the sequencing of the analysis is very tricky. What happens in 1973 when the two curves start to diverge is not that increased free trade is the driver of this. That comes later. The driver of this is, a is the destruction of a social contract that is blown up with the destruction of Bretton Woods and the liberalization of finance, which then makes possible the use of free trade to demolish the rest of the social model. So I think there are, uh, again, to revert to jargon, there are several intervening variables here. And the sequencing in this analysis is, is tricky, but an important part of the story. Thank you. I totally agree, Bob. That was uh, sort of my, uh, the first point that I skipped over quickly. Uh, when I said, uh, I was talking about, can, can governments do something about the labor market and uh, all the other kinds of good things that people have been talking about in terms of the wage problem and the earnings going to the top. And uh, I just passed that over. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is I'm, uh, I'm much more cynical about the capacities of, uh, the, of Canadian political institutions to deal with that problem precisely because of federalism. Right? Some provinces have dealt with it better than others. I mean, one, one mechanism has been raising the minimum wage. But it, excuse me, it, it, isn't the regulation of finance a federal function? That, yes. I don't know anything about that. <laughs> Yeah. The the uh, the main uh, there's there's a controversy on this, but my reading of the research literature is that the main source of that uh, the prosperity of the top one percent is uh, is a result of differences in labor market changes in labor market income. That is wages and salaries, not investment income. That is making that uh, th that surge over the, at least over the last thirty years. Well, yeah, and uh, so, could I just and, and, add? And, and just a little footnote to that: that's a problem uh, in English Canada, because our top earners in English Canada can be recruited into the United States. It hasn't been a problem in Quebec because the Quebec elites are much less mobile because of the language problem. Let them go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, very quick, uh, absolutely. I didn't try to load everything on, on that issue uh, of, of trade liberalization, absolutely. There's an elephant in the room in the 1970s which was the high inflation rate and all that, and that became an obsession of central banks. But the justification for all these things as it ensued had to do with issues of competitiveness. I mean, we heard that time and time again in budget speeches, you name it. So they're connected. That's all I'm going to say. There's no problem what you say about that. I'd like to uh, th thank you for putting the issue of VAT back on the agenda. I think that's a very important one. I think, however, it has become a more difficult one in recent years for a number of different reasons. You know, first of all, because some provincial governments have moved into 
occupy the space that uh, Har the Harper government abandoned. Uh, but more importantly is the question of uh, the online uh, purchasing that has, has happened and, and the number of uh, multinational corporations who do not collect VAT. They don't collect they don't, they don't pay income tax, but they don't even collect VAT, ranging from, uh, uh, from Google to uh, Facebook to Netflix to yeah. Uber. None of those, they, they're, they're not, for the most part, with a few exceptions, they're, they're not even collecting yeah. existing HST, let alone uh, an, inc you know, an increased HT, HST. So a government which were, was, would be interested in raising VAT at the federal level would have to be prepared to regulate those kinds of Absolutely. companies. Um, I would have bet uh, you a beard, uh, John, that that graph wasn't true, but you know, the data are the data. So uh, <laughs> that, that really astounded me. But I have a couple of, que a couple of points. One, one, one question. One is uh, the, the x-axis um, is probably significant, and we are assuming that at the top, Sweden there has no ta tax progressivity. In fact, it's 0.35 compared to 0.6, right? It's the relative pro uh, progressivity. I wonder if you could just comment a little bit on that because it's not a flat tax in Sweden and it's not a flat tax in the yeah. USA. It's the difference between the two. Um, the, other, the other question was um, uh, on the, the difference between, let's say, the top margin uh, of uh, income tax in Canada, 1960, say, versus today for the top bracket. What, what, what does it look like comparatively? Yeah. Okay, the, the, to answer your first question, the, uh, the tax progressivity measure is uh, basically like a Gini coefficient. That is, it, it measures shares uh, paid, uh, shares of Total income, you take total income, uh, total revenue, government revenue, and you figure out uh, which income categories uh, paid those taxes, uh, whether they're sales taxes. These are OECD numbers. Um, so, and I've, I've read up on, uh, I didn't do this calculation. I've tried to follow it up with the OECD. And uh, uh, I, I'm just, from what I've read, I'm assuming these numbers can be estimated with some accuracy. You, you kind of know which income categories are paying the VAT, and, and you certainly know which income categories are paying payroll taxes. So that's sort of what that is all about. And it's not that there's, like, the top marginal rates in the, some of the, in the Scandinavian countries are higher than they are here, right? That's not the issue. The issue is how much do you bring in, mm -hmm. right? And how do you bring it in? And the point is by just going after the top, you can tax the hell out of them, but that's not going to bring in uh, going to a 65% uh, marginal tax rate here in Canada on income. It's not going to raise total tax revenue up to even uh, mid, the, you know, above the mid level to say 0.38 or something like that. It'll it'll shift us a little bit, but the numbers that Lars estimates for that 65% uh, rate of um, marginal tax rate. All that's going to do is offset the cuts to the GST. That's about it, and which is a good thing. Right. Uh, the second question was. Uh, oh, uh, Lars, Lars would answer that better than I can. Certainly, they were higher than, <laughs> than they are now, right? We've gone through an era of cutting the top marginal rates. What did they peak at? Uh, if, if I could just answer that. OK. 1969. Top marginal rate in Ontario is over 100 percent. That includes both federal and provincial. That's pretty high. 100 percent. Isn't it time we put um, to bed our obsession with the deficit? And I'm I'm sorry to say that John seems to buy into the need. You know, if you cut taxes, where are you going to get the money from? Or if you increase expenditures, uh, you're going to have to get the money from somewhere. And I think that really needs to be put to bed. To, to the credit of uh, the federal uh, Liberal Party, they have not uh, gone ahead and eliminated their deficit. They've realized that that's not such a big issue. If you look at the deficits that Japan and 
the U.S. have incurred. It's not driving them into hyperinflation territory. So isn't it time we put aside our obsession with eliminating the deficit, especially when we've got the project of, the, of, of a Green New Deal uh, you know, around the corner, in, in front of our faces. How are we going to finance a Green New Deal? If, if you take into account you know, what people are saying about modern monetary theory, it's not necessary to raise every penny by taxation or through borrowing in order to finance a Green New Deal. So I think it's really important to come to grips with what this obsession with deficits and eliminating deficits is all about. Manfred? So I, I am not at all obsessed about deficits. I do obsess a little bit about debt. Um, and I obsess a little bit about debt because uh, what we're doing is we're transferring to the next generation all of the costs. Um, they're going to have to repay those costs. And that next generation is having a tough time. Right? They're starting their careers later. They're not earning salaries. They're not getting the kinds of benefits that we did. They're going to have to pay. right? The, the, the millennials and the post-millennials are going to have to pay for our retire, my retirement. They're going to have to pay for the green, uh, for uh, uh, the decarbonization of our environment. They're going to have to pay for rising health care costs, right? Uh, and their salaries and their benefits are not too hot, right? So I'm, I'm concerned about them and their willingness to finance. There's, there's, a, there's an issue here of uh, intergenerational justice that we have to be concerned about. But I, I've written about that elsewhere, but it's a kind of long story, I'll stay. Uh, I'm sorry? Well, actually, I, ha I don't agree with you at all on that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> if I could interject here, uh, which is that if we don't spend today, future generations will not have that public capital or whatever it is that will make them more productive to be able to generate the incomes for the future. It's the other way around. Now, it's true that if we just throw money out the window kind of thing, but if we engage in productive public investments, it is a legacy for the future generation. It is not a cost for the future generations because they will benefit from it just like our generation benefited from past public investments in human capital, healthcare, education, in physical capital, our highway, you name it. Uh, I don't buy that argument at all, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it's fine if it's for investment. <laughs> it's fine if it's for investment. Uh, I'd, I'd like to just go back to you, John, uh, and. The points that Robert Kuttner raised a bit earlier. I think there is a possibility that your message could be misconstrued, uh, and so I want to reinforce or see whether you would agree that the first thing that we have to understand is that the appropriate tax structure in a situation has to be evaluated in relation to the underlying income distribution and the underlying sources of income. The net, the net redistribution, yes. not, not just the yeah. tax. Yeah. That's just the revenue raising side. Right. You have to take account of the spending side. Sure. And um, so in Scandinavia, the, the basic situation is totally different. If you have a society where wage earners are doing relatively well and they can pay the, the taxes and receive the benefits, which was the essence of the, the post-war Scandinavian model, then, then uh, that is obviously a viable situation. In our situation, where that is not the point of departure, uh, I think we have to take into account, first of all, the political factors. And we have to remember that the, the mobilization that we've all talked about and that we all need is based in part around the perceived inequity of the current situation. I think we also have to pay attention not just to cross-sectional data, but to historical data. And that was a point that was made, that in the United States, uh, the tax rates were dramatically different at one time. And while, so that, ours. and while that wouldn't solve the problem, it would contribute to solving the problem. And particularly because the, the effect of those higher marginal tax rates on the output side are not clear at all in terms of the research evidence. 
So uh, my final point is just to ask you, Elizabeth Warren is putting a, a lot of emphasis on wealth taxes. Um, and she is, in fact, uh, arguing very strongly that a very small wealth tax would, uh, would make a very significant difference to the resources available for public expenditure. I had one quick question for, for Mario, uh, and I was really intrigued. The share of uh, in income going to wage earners has a really dramatic peak in 1991. Yeah, Can you say a few words what the hell that was all about? Well, <laughs> look, uh, we, we have a period here okay, where the, uh, uh, the sh that share of labor varies cyclically, you know, but if you look at the trend, I mean, that's the important thing. Now, cyclically, you're going to have a number of factors pushing it up, but obviously, if you're going to have uh, productivity that was slowing down during that period, but at some point, wages start to rise near the end of the 80s. Remember, we had a recession in 1990, 91 in Canada, okay? So in the late 80s, things had been beginning to pick up again. Okay? So you could see the dynamics of that at that level. That's all I want to say. But if you look at the trend, it starts in the 1970s, except for that local peak of the time. I don't have the graph here. But if you look at the, uh, the only time where there's that local peak is then. Okay? And uh, other than that, it just continued to decline. Okay? So it has to do with the cycle stuff. It's really, as I said, the, the key here is the trend of it, which I think is more important to take note of. But I, I understand your point there about that, that there is a kind of hump there that maybe you'd want to explain. But as I said, it could be explained in a fairly simple way, I would argue. You know, it was a, a period of the 80s where you had this uh, buildup uh, of you know, growth and demand and so on. And you recall, jo uh, what's his name, at the time it was uh, John Crow who was concerned about it so much, about the you know, inflation or wage inflation, I should say, uh, that he, he really paralyzed. You know, we had a made in Canada recession because of that, because of the Bank of Canada. In fact, there was almost a consensus at the time among economists yeah, that that was the reason why we had such a significant recession in the early 1990s. Uh, please don't get me wrong, Fred. You're misconstruing what I said. Right? I'm all in favor of increasing top marginal rates. I'm all in favor of wealth taxes. I have been arguing for 40 years that we should be bringing back inheritance taxes, especially for this generation. Um, my point is, let's start and look at the numbers and see how far that's going to get us in terms of increasing our national capacity to decommodify. That's, that's my only point. And I think for progressives, that's a hard jump to make because we are so used to this. Actually, when they brought in the GST, a lot of people on, a few people on the left, like uh, Neil, uh, the lawyer from Toronto, uh, yeah, and Leo Panitch, a number of those people said, hey, this stuff about uh, the, the GST being regressive is nonsense. Let's go with it. Yeah, it's just really kind of more, I guess, of an observation and a comment. I, I, I'm interested in um, the graph here and um, what it shows of the Scandinavian countries. And the few times I've had conversations with people from those countries, um, they've kind of indicated to me that people, generally speaking, don't mind um, because they understand the benefit to the larger society. I think the cost of living is higher too, but, but people there seem to manage quite well. Um, I noticed, you know, yesterday, for example, there's a, the, the, a lot of our, our talks are about monetary policy and all kind of premised on um, wages, monetary policy, etc. But I wonder what this would look like if we focused more on ethics. Um, and if the public discourse was more around ethics, and I think not even so much like social, I, I think of ethics even as being stronger than the idea of social justice, because social justice kind of suggests, I guess, that you know, if I am doing well, then I owe it to somebody else to sort of do my part, maybe. Anyway, that's what it brings up for me, where is that? The idea of ethics turns it back to me, and it's kind of like, how do I want to be as a human being? How do I view myself in terms of this, you know, my short time on Earth? Am I, am I proud and happy with what I have, uh, with, with how I have lived my life? And I think if we, I just wonder if we sort of brought in more, like, you know, what are we doing with, for example, the role of advertising in terms of creating wants and needs? And, you know, so much of our discussion is focused on how do we 
you know, make more things? How, you know, how do we, you know, how, how do we, yeah, how do we make more things? How do, you, how do we get people to consume more? But, uh, you know, we know that doesn't, that fundamentally isn't what brings, um, you know, a, a meaningfulness in people's lives. And I guess also just, uh, just uh, some comments I sort of wanted to make yesterday that didn't have the opportunity, um, just in terms of uh, discussions and sort of uh, understand, understanding what's oh, the, the, somebody brought up the role of shame. Um, and I believe that a lot of what happens is that we're putting, pitting groups against each other. And um, my, you know, uh, my background of the last decade has been really working in counseling. And a lot of what I do is, um, when I work with couples, it's helping people communicate. And one of my big, uh, what I try to point out to people is really in communication, the facts really don't mean a lot. It's really not the facts that get in the way, it's the feelings. And um, when people are able to listen to other people's perspectives, what their own personal histories have been, when we can do that, and when we can connect, not, you know, when we can stop arguing about facts and connect to the feelings underlying what's going on, that's when you get real communication. But I gotta tell you, it's not something that's done easily because um, we also need to have safety in communication. And that's something that's very hard to build. And so if we wanna get an understanding of people's experiences, we have to also be able to understand that people are going to be very reluctant to share their experiences until they have a sense that their views and experiences will really be um, listened to and heard and uh, respected. And I'll leave it at that. Okay. Final comments? I mean, uh, I'm not sure what I could say there except one thing, which is that uh, uh, on the issue that I had raised, I'm not going to talk about anything else. I will not ad address it. Uh, but uh, on the issues that I did raise there, which had to do with essentially interest rate policy and whose incomes are going to be maintained over time and all that, uh, that, that Pazinetti index that I had shown, I kind of flipped through very quickly there, uh, he, in fact, had written a lot on what we describe as the fair rate of interest idea based on principles of commutative justice. That is to say that a fair rate that will maintain over time certain capital that whatever your savings are, maintain them at a certain level without necessarily giving you more than that, so to mm -hmm. speak, right? And he justifies it on certain principles. I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but that's an area where one can consider all these issues of justice with the issue of monetary policy, which sounds so aloof, so far away, okay? But one can bring it at that level, perhaps. But honestly, I, I'm sorry that I can't, you know. Just on the, a small point on the ethics issue, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, Hugh Hecklow, who was one of the major uh, in my generation, people in the development of the welfare state talks about the fact that it never happened unless there was a moral movement behind it. Uh, if you want to read something more contemporary, uh, I take a look at Jerry Cohen's book, it's, which is called, uh, if, if you're an egalitarian, how come you're so rich? <laughs> <laughs> Jerry is one of the top analytical philosophers of the second half of the 20th century, originally from Montreal. Okay, so should we give a hand of applause to our awesome speakers? <laughs>